So thank you very much for your attention. We're going to move on quickly uh, to Murat Fudim, who will tell us about uh, the mechanism of action of this new approach to treating heart failure. And then we'll look at some clinical data. Murat. Thank you. So I was asked then specifically to talk about um, the mechanism of battery reflex, uh, battery reflex stimulation and you know, sort of the pathology that leads uh, in heart failure to a dysregulation and then what battery reflex stimulation could uh, help and contribute to get us out of this dilemma. And I will try to give you a little bit more, um, I'll give you a little bit more background about what that nebulous term neuromodulation really means. Because it's sometimes very easy to throw out that term neuromodulation and then sort of assume that everybody understands what that means. So I'll go a little bit in depth into the, uh, into the data to date. So we'll review anatomy and physiology. There will be a little bit of repetition of what Dr. Zal just did early in the talk on barrier stimulation therapy. And then I will uh, talk about how the system is affected by uh, the device. So copy-paste slide from what I just did two seconds ago. I promise only two slides I'm copy-pasting. And it's on neuromodulation. So when we think about neuromodulation, we often think that the brain and the heart talk via an efferent pathway. It's the brain telling the heart, you need to do this, you need to do that lower the sympathetic tone or increase the parasympathetic tone. However, it's really the afferent input into the brain that we believe to date is actually the key driver of autonomic dysfunction in heart failure. And it's so the afferent pathways from barrier receptors in the carotid and the aorta, as well as chemoreceptors or mechanoreceptors spread out through the entire body that modulate the sympathetic output by the brain. And there are numerous switch stations in the body and it is believed that the uh, barrier reflex actually hierarchically one of the uh, overruling uh, 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 reflexes in the body, even though there's a lot of anatomical spread of barrier reflexes throughout the body. But the carotid barrier reflex, as uh, shown here on the top left, is one of the key ones next to the arterial chemoreceptors coming from the carotid body, the pulmonary barrier receptors, et cetera, et cetera. So the system has a lot of input into the body, and actually each of those ref reflexes have been reviewed and studied in animals and in human models and have been identified to be dysregulated in the input to the brain as a reflex. The CNS puts out too much sympathetic tone, too little parasympathetic tone. So the very reflex, you know, sort of labeled as a supervisor and the way, uh, the reason I call it supervisor is because it's for whatever reason, you know, God or nature, whatever you believe in, put it into quite important location in the body. It put it in the carotid location where it has to regulate the blood flow to the brain, the second most important organ in our body. And uh, nobody picked up, all right, all right. All right. So, um, so, so the, um, for whatever reason, regulating the pressure going to the brain is clearly of a significant importance to the body. So that's where the barrier reflex sits. What does it do when you activate it? It lowers, it senses a high pressure state. If you're sensing a high pressure state, it does not want too much pressure to the brain. It lowers the blood pressure, lowers the heart rate. If it senses a low pressure state, it increases the blood pressure and increases the heart rate in patients that are normal. So here's an actual demonstration of patients on the left with heart disease and on the right without heart disease, what that barrel reflex sensitivity is. And that's a term you might hear again and again. So barrel reflex sensitivity means if you give somebody a hypotensive or hypertensive impulse or you apply suction to the neck, as a matter of fact, that's one gold standard way to test it. You can apply a vacuum to the neck and decrease the pressure locally, and that induces a state for the barrier reflex where it thinks there is a hypotensive state and it overreacts. And that overreaction is what you see in the slide. In a heart failure patient, there's no change in beat to beat variability. That's the RR. But there will be an increase in blood pressure. Great. So there is some barrier reflex sensitivity still present in a heart failure patient. But this is the normal response on the right. You're supposed to have a lot of variability in both the arterial and the heart rate response and not, um, you know, discapitated response where it stays on for a long time, even though the impulse of, let's say, suction on the neck or a drop in blood pressure with nitroglycerin was only very short. You see, in heart failure, the, the aberrant response persists way too long. And what you want to see is on the right side, in a healthy adult, you want to have a linear response where... The decrease in blood pressure results in a better reflex sensitivity and appropriate response. More decrease in blood pressure results in a greater response. And that should persist across heart rate and blood pressure responses. So that's what we call better reflex sensitivity. Just the technicality to get that out of the way. So in heart failure now, that better reflex sensitivity, which we'll not go over again, is decreased. 
in controls here in white, you have more response, more sensitivity, and heart failure, it's lower. And we have been shown it again, again, across a numerous studies. And those studies are primarily done in half ref, where the barrier reflex is more dysregulated than in half PEF. And then if you now look across the NYHA scale, the sicker the patient, the more dysregulated is the barrier reflex. The sensitivity goes down, your barrier reflex is dysregulated, so too low in its output to the brain, the sicker you are. Not surprisingly now you would say if the sensitivity is low, the lower you go, the higher the mortality. So it's all of sort of makes sense. What is a chicken or egg? I don't know. They're probably uh, gaining the system where they're probably influencing each itself throughout the course of the disease state. I did this slide early in the talk, so I'm not gonna make a history talk out of this, but Brownwald and his first wife, Nina, here on the left, Nina Brownwald, she was a surgeon actually. I bet she did all the work and he took all the credit. Is this recorded? <laughs> all right, all right, I'm fired. So this, <laughs> this was one of his first projects and um, he stimulated the battery reflex. So really the idea is not that new. He stimulated it surgically. Back then, of course, a much more morbid procedure. But they're the same thing, an IPG, the impulse pulse generator, implanted pulse generator was a tunnel line, they stimulated in patients and had it in for days, exercised the patients. And what they found out is that if you stimulate this uh, reflex, you could actually lower the blood pressure, acute drop, you could lower the heart rate. And what they figured out back then, you didn't have the drugs. If we do that in patients with angina, that's what they did it back for, angina, because they didn't have PCI, they didn't have coronary angiography at that time point, they figured out that could actually improve exertional capacity. And they did that in a series of studies, in a series of papers published as shown here, they were able to have patients exercise longer at a lower blood pressure and at a lower heart rate. So this led actually to the initial attempts for barrier stimulation therapy to be an antihypertensive therapy. But then it shifted to be a heart failure specific therapy, but it's not you know, to discredit the antihypertensive properties. So what underlies the neuromodulation effect. You know, it's a big board, but you know, let's break it down and see what it actually means. So uh, there are a series of effects and the effect can be measured. You could first measure the sensitivity of your reflex actually getting better. That's one thing. I told you, I promise you I won't talk about it again. It's too complicated. But you could measure catecholamine levels. You could measure catecholamine levels. You could measure angiotensin two levels. And those have been shown in animal and in human studies to improve A, if you chronically stimulate half ref dogs, pace dogs, you actually could stimulate them for long enough where the survival improved as well. This is the animal study shown here. So decrease in catecholamine levels, decrease angiotensin two, angiotensin two levels, and if you pace the barest reflex in dogs, you tend to improve the survival. Translating it to human data, Dr. Zal showed that data earlier, there is open label half ref data in humans out of Europe where they stimulated the nerve uh, the barrel reflex, I'm sorry, and they were able to show that the muscle sympathetic nerve activity here on the left, this is the gold standard to measure the actual firing of the neurons coming from the brain, but you measure it actually in the leg. So muscle sympathetic nerve activity refers to that. So you see that the neuronal, neuronal activity is going down. So the sympathetic nervous system is just quieting down. And on the right side, you see that barrel reflex sensitivity goes up at the same time. It makes sense. It, it's, it does what it's supposed to do. It activates the uh, barrel reflex, which is increasing parasympathetic tone, decreasing sympathetic tone. All right. So there are also vascular effects. So the effects that we see as now the global output of the sympathetic tone is going down to the body, this is still very nebulous. So while the catecholamine levels go down, but how do you actually achieve what you will see in the next slides presented by Dr. Abraham and others is that, well, how do we achieve a greater six minute walk distance? Why do they feel better? And it's possibly that it's achieved simply by a decreased vascular tone. So I told you it's an antihypertensive effect. We have shown it again and again in a, in a time when there was no antihypertensive therapies, the applied blood pressure goes down. But as we've heard a lot at this meeting, there might be also venous effects. The veins which store the majority of blood volume, and I hate to preserve it on this volume distribution concept, but a lot of the blood volume shifts is what induces cardiac decompensation, whether acutely or chronically. What if we actually dilate the veins? It's really, really hard to measure venous tone, but in animal studies, you can do that. And this study here actually tested baroreceptor stimulation, showed a dilation of the venous system, literally the splenching vascular pool dilated and pulled more blood, vo uh, more blood volume, 
and they compare it to S&P, which is sodium nitroprusside. So they said, well, is it worth like a drug? Because we know sodium nitroprusside can very significantly dilate the abdominal pool, and it did exactly the same effect. As opposed to injecting angiotensin II or epinephrine, no epinephrine, which basically constrict the abdominal blood pool and shift the blood volume north. To move it then to humans, we saw that in a case with heart failure preserved ejection fraction and underlying hypertension where the device was turned on and off two days after implantation. And what was found is that the, first of all, the blood pressure went down, this PV loop, sorry to do that to you all, but the PV loops show the peak systolic pressure goes down acutely. It is an acute on off effect. Blood pressure goes down. But if you look to the right bottom, this is what we call the LVDP. The LVDP decreased from 19 to 13. There's an acute shift uh, uh, in, in pressures downwards. Well, this, score, of course, can be achieved by a reduction in afterload because the blood pressure just went down and the, you know, the, um, the non-seen venous effects because it's not easy to measure those unless you're an animal and we do really, really hard uh, uh, scientific setups. Last but not least, they also observed renal effects. And here we have to, again, go back to uh, animal studies because we were able to demonstrate the following. First of all, to the left, you do decrease catecholamine levels. I mean, you can show it again and again. You turn the device on, catecholamine levels go down, blood pressure goes down. So those that know that, uh, most of us probably know that if we decrease blood pressure, the kidneys see less perfusion, the GFR actually drops. But here comes a cool thing. In this animal study, despite the drop in mean arterial pressure, why it is during stimulation, this is days at a time, the GFR did not drop the urine sodium excretion did not drop. So what that means is despite a drop in blood pressure in this hypertensive animal model, the GFR did not drop. So there was actually an, excre an ex increased perfusion to the kidneys and or less sodium avidity. So the kidney was dumping salt and water even though it was getting less perfusion. So there are possible also those renal effects that, that could account some of the benefits we see in humans. All right, summary. Autonomic nervous system is obviously integral to the cardiovascular system. We know that. Uh, hopefully I broke down the magic word of neuromodulation, a little bit down more so we know what the individual components are and how the barrier reflex actually acts on those. And then um, I'll hand off to Dr. Rawal. Thank you very much.